all right. This evening's sermon I had mentioned last week, it's not, not necessarily a series, but I'm going to be preaching somewhat of a part one, part two on the promise of God. Last week I talked about our inheritance through the promise of God. This week I'm going to talk about the genealogy of the promise of God. Now I'm going to have more of a, a longer you know, uh, introduction to kind of set the stage for what I'm going to be talking about shortly here in just a few minutes. But I want to make a statement before I go on right now. I, I submit to you that the entire Bible, from beginning to end, dispensationalists will disagree with this, many people will disagree with this. The Bible and the Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures, all of them, the sole purpose is to point towards Jesus Christ. That is the sole purpose. From the time the Gospels, at the time the Gospels were written, the pen, the, the, that actual time when it took place on this earth, his life and when he died, everything after that, the scriptures all just point you back to the cross. That is the purpose of the Bible. That is the purpose of all of humanity is the pivotal point of history of everything. People want to study history. They want to find out, hey, what's important in life? What's significant? There was a moment when God in the flesh died on the cross, and all of history was looking up to that point, and right now all of history, just all of all of present day just looks back to that. Right. That is the purpose of life. It truly is. The Bible starts out in Genesis chapter number one, where God creates man. I've heard many people say that the Bible, you know, in, in a sense, is about God, it talks about God, and it talks about man. And you have, in, in Genesis chapter 1, you have God creating man, God creating creation, and he has a relationship with his creation. That relationship is broken. You see at the end that God finally redeems all of mankind, and he restores that relationship, right? But it had to take place through God as a man. He brought that relationship back together. And from the very beginning, he desired that relationship again. That same God desiring that relationship with his creation was the one who brought the relationship back, and that's how it's restored in Revelation chapter number 22. Now, before I get into more of the introduction that will be relative to the sermon tonight, I want to give you <coughs> just a couple of things about the King James Bible and why I think, I believe that every word in the King James Bible is perfect. I believe it's pure from the bottom of, you know, from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. I mean, I believe it's per pure. It's perfect. Every bit of it. Every word. I believe it's perfect in the English language. I don't only, let me say that because a lot of people that would agree with that, but then they would disagree with this. I believe that the order of the books are perfect. And I believe if you look at the order of the books and you study the order of the books, no man could put them in this perfect position in this perfect place. Flip back just to Malachi, chapter number 4, the very end of the Old Testament. I want you to look at the very end of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, now just if you think, <coughs> you know, obviously there was a point when we didn't have all of the canon put together. What we know is what is scripture, right? Once that canon was, you know, was put together and culminated, I believe that God guided that process and all the books went into a perfect, perfect spot, perfect place from beginning to end. Look how the very end of the Old Testament ends. Look at Malachi chapter number 4, verse number, verse number 4. Remember ye the law of Moses. And what is the Old Testament? What is the Testament? It's the law, right? And he ends it saying, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Oreb, for all Israel <coughs> with the statutes and judgments. Notice he, he references the nation of Israel. Very much so in the Old Testament, he deal, God deals with the nation of Israel almost the entire time. This is... Basically a conclusion of all of the Old Testament. Now watch this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. And he says, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. You get into Matthew chapter number one. The very first thing that it does is it gives you the genealogy. It gives you, as it refers to it as, the generations of... Of Jesus Christ, because the whole Old Testament was pointing towards Jesus Christ coming. You open your Bible, very first scripture that's pinned down, in the New Testament, is the generations of Jesus Christ. Because that's all of what the Old Testament was pointing towards. What's one of the very first things you see arrive? Who was John the Baptist? He was in the spirit of Elijah. See how it's laid out perfectly like that? Matthew, of the Gospels, you have four Gospels. <clears throat> of all the Gospels, do you know which Gospel quotes the Old Testament the most? Matthew. Do you know which gospel is the most, you know, uh, let me word this, forgive me for this language, but Jewish in nature? 
you know, has that Old Testament feel? Matthew. I mean, right here, what is the what is the concept that's laid out? Because you have his genealogy given twice. You know where he starts? Abraham. Do you know the other delineation, the other division? David, king of the Jews. See how he's still speaking? It's a slow transition from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? How it transitions from the Old Testament into the New Testament. I believe that that is perfectly laid out. And it's, and it's a perfect transition. It's a perfect train of thought of how he transitions from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And like I said, it quotes the most scripture. It's the kingdom is spoken of. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Actually, I think it's kingdom of heaven occurs in the book of Matthew. Kingdom of God does not. Kingdom of heaven is referred to repeatedly. And what are all the Jews looking for? The kingdom, right? That's what they talk about. That's even what, what uh, his disciples will refer to, right? Is the kingdom. The whole Old Testament is just pointing towards Jesus. And then all of the New Testament, all of the scriptures, they all of them, which were written afterwards, they're all pointing you to. Everything points to the cross. Everything. And we're going to take a look here in just a moment, but the basically the summary of all the Old Testament is... Part of it is here in Matthew chapter number one. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter number three. But really, it's in you can you can say that it's in Luke chapter number three. Now, in Luke chapter number three, what you have is is you have the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't only begin with Abraham. It doesn't only begin with Abraham. It actually, it's actually given in reverse order. It, it begins <coughs> technically with Jesus. And then it goes all the way back and doesn't stop at Abraham. Let me word it that way. It goes all the way back to Adam. The entire Old Testament, this is what I'm going to get into tonight, the genealogy of the promise. The entire Old Testament, the purpose is to trace that bloodline from the very first man that was ever born on this earth all the way to the Messiah. All the scripture that's written about, all of it, of course, there's other principles we can learn. There's other things, the giving of the law, all of that. But the overarching purpose, the overarching you know, point of life in general is for the Messiah to come and redeem us and that God receives glory as the Messiah. The whole Old Testament is just the following of that bloodline. All the way from the beginning of, of Genesis chapter number 3, which we're going to look at here in just a minute, all the way... To the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look here in Luke chapter number 3, in verse number 23, is where it begins. Luke chapter number 3, verse number 23, <coughs> says this, And Jesus himself <coughs> began to be out about 30 years of age, being, and then it says, as was supposed. That's, a, a, that meaning, that's what people think, or that's what people supposed or thought. They presume that. As was supposed the son of Joseph, implying he was not, because we know that God was his father, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Jana, which was the son of Joseph, which was the, the son of Mat uh, Mattathias, which was the son of Amos, which was the son of Nahum, which was the son of Ephli. And it goes on and on and on. It goes through all of these kings. If you read through here, you can go and find these kings. It follows that bloodline all throughout Judah. That promise is given to Abraham. The promise is then afterwards given to David. And you know when it starts, when it talks about all these kings, these kings, especially the kings of Judah, it mentions Israel as well because there is definitely a significance of the people up that were, when, when they had split ways and they became, you know, basically they're considered Sumerians by the time Christ appears. But they're, they're definitely, you know, uh, significant because they have a lot of dealings politically with that other nation, you know, at that time. But when it's, when it's, you need to pay attention to these. This is my, my, my introduction point. You need to pay attention to all the, all of the kings that are spoken of. Zerubbabel. Like, why is this guy important? You know why? Because he's found in this genealogy. Do you know why all those kings were all spoken of? Everything that was recorded all throughout the Old Testament because it was pointing towards the promise that would ultimately be fulfilled through that seed that you're reading about all throughout the Old Testament the entire time. It's just waiting. And you never know when the Messiah is going to be born next. Everyone's waiting. No one knew the exact time. There were hints that were given. There was a timeline that was laid out in the book of Daniel. But before that timeline, they're just waiting for the Messiah. And that promise started all the way back in Genesis 3. A lot of people would disagree with that. That's why I'm making this point right now. A lot of people would say, because <clears throat> they have a system, dispensationalists have a system, the Adamic covenant, right? The Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic co covenant. And they said all of these are separate covenants. They're not the same. And the promise that was given to Abraham of the coming Messiah 
Yeah, you can find hints of it in Genesis 3, but that's not the same promise they say. They say that's not the same gospel. I submit to you, and I'm gonna, we're going to look at an example of this tonight, but every promise of the people that you find in his genealogy, every covenant that's given of a seed passed down throughout his lineage is the same covenant and the same gospel and the same uh, a promise of the same seed that would ultimately come, which would be Christ. Now, if you keep following this, it goes back. You know, we can see David there, verse 32, which was the son of Jesse, says which was the son of Obed. And David was obviously right before that. You keep going down, and then verse 38, finalized there, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now, once you turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 3, where this promise was first given, was initially given of <coughs> The coming Messiah. And I'm going to prove to you that the same covenant, plain scripture, irrefutable, the same exact covenant here that's given to Adam and Eve of the seed that would be born of them, and they would be the progenitor of, that the same covenant, the same promise that was given to them is the same promise, the same covenant given to you. <clears throat> look in uh, Genesis chapter number 3, look at verse number 13. It says, speaking unto the woman, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Watch this. And I will put enmity. That's the feeling of being an enemy or the state of someone being your enemy. Like animosity almost. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And then watch this. And between thy seed and her seed. Say, I'm going to put enmity between the devil and the woman's seed. It shall, it there is referring to the woman's seed. It shall bruise thy head. Watch this. And thou shalt bruise his heel, saying the seed is going to bruise the serpent's head, and the serp and and the seed will. It says, and the, the, I'm sorry, let me explain that again. Saying that the serpent will bruise his, the seeds, talking about Jesus, the Messiah's heel, right? And he will bruise his head. The seed will, saying that he will ultimately defeat the serpent, defeat the devil. Sin has been now brought into the world, right? And who brought that into the world? Who was the tempter, if you will? Satan, right? So when we get victory, ultimately over death and over hell, we are receiving victory over Satan. Satan was the one who initially brought sin into the world. Obviously, man made the decision, but he came, the tempter came, and he was the catalyst to that. He caused them to be tempted. He went and tempted uh, you know, Adam and Eve, and they ate thereof. Now, I, I want you to turn, keep your hand here, because we're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis. But I want you to turn over to Romans, chapter number 16. <clears throat> Romans, chapter number 16. So who was that seed that was referring to again? It was Jesus, right? <clears throat> Romans, chapter number 16. Because a lot of people, like I said, they'll say, they'll break up their Bibles into all these different promises, all these different inheritance, all these different covenants. They have the Adamic covenant. They have the Abrahamic covenant. They have all these different, you know, the law, grace, right? It's all the same. It's all the same covenant that's ultimately going to be well, uh, inherited through Christ. Look at Romans chapter number 16. This would be considered written in the church age to a dispensationalist, right? Look at Romans chapter number 16. I want you to look at verse number 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Has anybody ever noticed that verse before? The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. You know, you know it's very obvious that this is pointing back to Genesis chapter number 3. Right? The Bible talks about us being in Christ, right? That we are accounted as Christ. We're accounted as being his seed, right? Because we're in Christ. We put on Christ, the Bible says. And we inherit things through Christ. And right here, and we saw clearly that it was the seed of the woman, referring to the coming Messiah, that would be the one that would bruise Satan under his feet, right? But now, who do we see 
you know, uh, be inheriting that promise? Or who do we see that being fulfilled through? He's writing it to the Romans, which by any by any dispensationalist, by any you know Bible scholar or theologian, they would all say this is the the age of grace, which we would still be in today. So you guess who that promise is being fulfilled through? It's being fulfilled through Christians that have believed in Jesus Christ. Amen. So that promise that was given in Genesis chapter number 3 is fulfilled through you as a Christian. Amen. That same promise that was given to Adam and Eve that there would be one day a Messiah that would come and deliver them from sin, from death, from hell, was fulfilled in Christ. And you being in Christ take part in that. We can see that here in Romans chapter number 16. Now I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 6. Because I want to focus on something very specific. Because there's a mis- there's a story because of, of dispensationalism. And because of this false idea and this uh, misconception that so many people have of, of these unbiblical divisions in their Bible. It causes people to, to misunderstand a lot of stories that are told in the Bible. Because... They don't realize that it's all just about Jesus, that it's all pointing to Jesus. I want to point out something here in Luke chapter number 3 in the genealogy, something specific. And I'm going to show you that there's a story that you're very familiar with tonight, but you probably have a lot of misconceptions about that story. And the reason being because you didn't realize that that same covenant was a covenant that was given in Genesis chapter number 3. That that same covenant was a covenant that was given in Genesis chapter number 13 and chapter number 16 with Abraham. Luke chapter number 3, and I'm going to read to you. We we actually read over this, or we did not read this. I skipped this part. But it says this, in the line of Jesus, someone born of Jesus... Or of, of Jesus' line, in Jesus' line, it says in, in Luke chapter number 3, verse number 36, it says, Which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sem, that would be Shem in the Old Testament. And then it says this, which was the son of Noe. That would be, we would refer to Noe in the, in the Old Testament as Noah. I'm going to be preaching to you tonight, the title of the sermon is The Covenant of Noah. And I'm going to show you tonight, without a shadow of a doubt that the promise of the covenant that you, you know, are so familiar with and have probably have been taught misconceptions all throughout your life, uh, you know, uh, uh, falsehoods, if you will, actually that covenant was not an independent covenant that was given to Noah. But the covenant that was given to Noah before he got on the ark was the same covenant that was given to Abraham. And the exact same covenant that was given in Genesis chapter number 3. And that the entire Bible points to Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, pointing to Matthew chapter number 1, when the the Messiah or the Christ will someday come. Now look in Genesis, as I said, Genesis chapter number 6, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, (coughs) we're going to come back to this. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Now right there he actually tells you how long from this point that it's going to be. Until he floods the earth. That's what he's saying right here. When he says his days shall be 120 years. If you calculate this out from this point forward. It was 120 years when God flooded the earth. That's actually what he's speaking of. When he says he also is flesh. He's saying his spirit is not always going to strive with man's spirit. Because he's also flesh. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And then he's referring to his flesh obviously. We're going to see that here in a minute. Man's flesh. Because God is not a flesh. He's saying... And that he is that he is going to that he's, his spirit is not always going to strive with man's spirit because he's also flesh, saying he's going to cut off all flesh. Of course, what we know to happen in the story of Noah, <clears throat> verse four. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God, <coughs> excuse me, came in under the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old. Men of renown. Now, there's a false doctrine, right, that is, that will be taught from verse number four, known as the Nephilim doctrine, right? Nephilim just means he. It means giant in Hebrew. That's all that the word means. 
The NIV just thinks they're slick. I believe it's the NIV, and they just they just transliterate the word Nephilim. That's all that they do. And the people, all these internet keyboard warriors, are like, you know, Nephilim. That sounds cool. Yeah, it comes from another language, goofball. That's why. Nephilim, it's not some cryptic doctrine. All it means is giant. And you can get an idea. People will say, like, they'll go to, like, the book of Enoch, which is trash and garbage. It is not the Bible. Amen. They'll go to the book of Enoch, and they'll say, they'll read in the book of Enoch where it says that there were men that were 400 feet tall. That's nothing even close to what the Bible is, the definition of a giant is. Right. The Bible gives you definitions of what giant, uh, the tallest man was like, what, was it like 13 feet or something like that? If even that, 12 feet, foot, something like along those lines. It's no bigger than like 14, 15 feet for sure. It may, 13 may have even been a couple of feet larger than the tallest man. I think his bed is 13 feet. So he's probably like 11 feet, something, something like that. Do you realize the difference between 400 and 11 feet tall? Uh -huh. That is ridiculous. It's, right. You know what it does? It makes this Bible a joke. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. People look at the Bible already and they think it's like people that aren't saved. They think it's like filled with error and like you know falsehood and it's almost like fairy tale. And then when you start walking around telling people, hey, you know, the Bible teaches people are 400 feet tall a few years back. It's like get out of here with that stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't don't fall into like stupidity that the Bible doesn't teach. This is what you need. Not the book of Enoch. Nothing like that. God preserved this unto you. Amen. Amen. Sons of God here, all it's saying, it says this. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. So you have chronologically, you have giants also after that. This secedes that. It means it comes after that, right? Also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same, saying the children of the sons of God and the daughters of men, they bear children, says the same. Their children became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. They're not the giants. The giants were already there. When it says sons of God, it's talking about that same lineage. And that's important with the subject tonight that was spoken of in uh, Luke chapter number 3. Because what is Adam referred to as? A son of God. I believe that that's a spiritual reference to people that are saved when he gives that to Adam there. Because right here, who are the sons of God? Spiritual reference. Do you know why the world became wicked? Get this. It's because the spiritual, the saved, the sons of God of which that, that Messiah would be born one day, they mixed and, 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 and uh, you know, intermingled with the heathen is what happened. The daughters of men. It's just saying with anyone. What would happen... When if you were to take, you know, if we were to just allow uh, our children who were raised with good morals, who were raised with with Bible discipline, Bible principles, if you were to just let them marry the daughters of men and, and we were the only bastion left of Christianity, what would happen to the world? It would get a lot worse, right? Let's say 50 percent of the world was 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 godly. 50 percent was wicked. And then they, they, they mix. Are the 50 percent that's good going to make the 50 percent? That's evil good? No, it's always reverse order. Always. All throughout the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? All throughout the Bible. What happened here was the saved, <coughs> they, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, intermingled with the heathen. The sons of God are those which are mentioned in, in Luke chapter number 3, that same lineage and that same line. We're talking about Enos, right? The Enoch. That same line. That's what it's referring to. Verse number 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <clears throat> and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls, and the, and I'm sorry, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse number eight. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So I grew up as an independent Baptist. I grew up in Sunday school my entire life. I was taught the story of that is like the most popular story to teach children. I was taught Noah's Ark so many times. And I grew up with the idea or the conception that that God <coughs> chose Noah primarily because Noah was just a good person 
Or that's why God was God salvaged Noah and because he had lived and he was a righteous man. And what they would specifically do, which this is which I'm not saying he wasn't, I'm sure he was. But they would always, I remember these verses being quoted when I was taught that. And they would show these verses. But if you look in verse number 8, what does the Bible say? This is the first misconception about this situation that I want to point out. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What is grace? It's something you do not deserve. So what Noah is about to be given, is it something that he deserved? No, it's not something that he deserved. Right? It's not because Noah was just like this extreme, I don't know exactly the life that he lived, but it's not just because what he's given, the covenant that is made with him here in just a few minutes, is not a covenant because of just the, the, the super righteous life that he lived. Now, he may be, he might have in a sense lived a righteous life. Obviously, we know there's not righteous, no, not one sense of being totally sinless. But that's not the reason why this covenant was made with him. And I'm going to show you that here in just a moment without a shadow of a doubt. I'm going to prove everything with scripture. It says in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And it says that Noah walked with God. So it does seem to say that he has good fellowship with God as well and lives a righteous life. In the sense of, you know, obviously not being, he's not sinless is my point. But this is what the point that I want to make right now, which is, catch this. The reason why this covenant was made with him was not, was not because of the way that he lived his life daily. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. The Bible says in that context of what we just read, please keep your hand there in Genesis 6 if you haven't dropped it already. The Bible said in Genesis chapter number 6, in that context, it said, it was talking about how wicked and how evil the world was, right? And how God was going to destroy the world. And then it said this, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you know what that tells me? That God, that God should have destroyed Noah too. Think about that. Did, here, did you, do you deserve something if I give you grace? Do you think my paycheck every week if I, I tell them hey, you are gracious? For paying me for working 40 hours. No, I deserve that, right? Because I went out, I did the labor that I agreed with them, right? And if, you know, for that wage, and then they pay it to me, right? That's not grace. Grace is something that you do not deserve. So when he's explaining that all these people are wicked, all these people have done evil, and then he says this, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that's what Noah deserved too. Noah deserved to be destroyed too. We all deserve hell, which is far worse than what's coming to what came to them, right? And eternal punishment in hell is a lot worse than what came to the world at that time. It tells you why Noah was the heir of this covenant and why God chose Noah. Look at Hebrews chapter number 11. Look at verse number 7. It says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, Watch this. By the which he condemned the world. Look at this. And became heir. Watch this. Of the righteousness which is by faith. His righteousness was not a righteousness which he had earned or worked for on his own. The righteousness that it refers to in Genesis chapter number 6. That was a righteousness which because he had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God had grace with Noah. Why? Because Noah was a man of great faith, the Bible tells you. He became heir. I want you to hang on to that word, too. And we'll look at that in a minute. It kind of ties in with the series of what we're talking about. He became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. The, a, an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Go back to Genesis chapter number 6. And let's look at verse number... We'll read verse number 9 again. <coughs> Context begins there. These are the generations of Noah... Noah was a just man and perfect and in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, look at this. I want you to pay close attention. I'm going to show, point out a second misconception to you in the story of Noah. God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. The statement that God just made unto Noah, does it seem like God, God's mind is made up? 
on who and how many of those that are on the earth that he's going to destroy, or his mind really isn't made up? Do you understand the question? Does it sound like, hey, I'm going to give them a second opportunity, and I'm going to send you forth to preach, right? And if they repent, then they do this, or it's already too late. It's too late. He said very plainly, he said, the end of all flesh is come before me, right? For the earth is filled. He's talking about everyone. For the earth is filled with violence through them. He says, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. All flesh. Verse, verse number 14, we'll read through here. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, <coughs> and shalt pitch it within, without, with pitch. It's a tar-like substance. And this is the fashion... Or, or, or the manner, the way, which thou shalt make of, make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a, and, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Watch this. He's going to reiterate... <coughs> And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. You know, when kids learn about the story of Noah, what do they always tell you? There's animals, and they get on the ark. Do you know, it's almost like God knows. God, I'm sure he does, of course. I know that God, because he knows all things. It's almost like God purposely words things these way, because he, he knew that people were going to have misconceptions of who he is. You understand what I'm saying? Because people like God wouldn't do that. And a lot of atheists, even if you've looked at material that are put out, why they don't believe in God, it's like because he's mean. Because he was, wit he, you know, he did all these, these these things to people, and he killed so many people. So I don't believe in him because he's mean. That's basically what he said. And you know, and even Christians, even this is the point I want to make right now, will 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 say like, you know, well, I don't think that God like he he really wanted to destroy everybody. I think he did it for this reason or that reason. And they'll like try to make excuses for God that he didn't make this decision in order to do this. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, God didn't want the whole world to perish, but God, look what he says right there. How he words this. Look again, verse 17. And behold, I, watch this, even I. Like, hey, you didn't think it was me? Hey, old I, even I. Like, like It's like the exception. Do you understand how he words that? Like, hey, you might not have thought I would have done this, but hey, behold, I, even I, will bring a flood of waters upon the earth. He says, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Look what he says. To destroy all flesh. How many is he going to destroy that lives upon the earth? Everyone. All flesh, right? Everyone. All flesh, he said. He says, uh, I lost my spot here. Where are we at? Verse number 17. Destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything... That is in the earth shall die. See how he's explicit and he's, and he's, he's like trying to be very clear. Everyone's going to be destroyed. Everyone and everything. I'm killing everyone. Animals, everything that is in the, that the breath of life is in. Right? Look at the next verse. But, this is the only exception. But with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark. Thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. I, I know that this is in many movies, and I know that I even have seen this portrayed. This idea that when, that when Noah was in building the ark, in the process of building the ark, that Noah was trying to coerce or trying to persuade people to do what? Get on the ark. God already had his mind made up. God said, I'm killing and I'm destroying everyone. They had no opportunity. They had no chance. God had had enough. I'm sure there were prophets and preachers already there. God didn't just not give them, you know, not come to them and give them a warning. All throughout the Bible, God sends prophets. Before, like, even with the nation of Israel, what did he do repeatedly? Sent prophets over and over and over again. He said, last of all, I sent my son. He gives people warnings because he loves us, right? They were sent prophets. They were sent people to preach unto them and to warn them. And they didn't hearken unto God's voice. And they continued down that path. And then God finally said, that's enough. You have no opportunity. You have no chance. Noah was not going and Noah was not preaching to them that, hey, guys, 
you can be saved. Guess what? The dimensions of the ark were already laid out. There's not enough room for you. That's what he would have had to say to them. Hey, you guys can't fit. I'm sorry. You know, you're not going to be able to fit in here. we got a bunch of animals we're going to have to put in here. You know, that's what the Bible teaches, all flesh. And he says, but, look how specific he is even when he gives the covenant. He says this, but with thee. That's singular. King James Bible, T-H-E-E. He says, but with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou, thou, singular, shalt come into the ark. Thou, watch this, and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. God's mind is made up. That's the second misconception. But there is a, 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 a minimal truth in what people will say. Because they say that Noah was preaching, right? They say he was preaching to get people on the ark. It's true that Noah was preaching. That's true. But the message that Noah was preaching is not what they say he was preaching. I want you to turn in your Bibles. <coughs> Go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter number 2. <laughs> Now, when the Bible said that, that Noah was a righteous man, we looked it up there in, in uh, Hebrews. How was Noah righteous? How did Noah receive his righteousness? What did the Bible say? Faith. Through faith, right? <clears throat> Look at 2 Peter chapter number 2. Whoops. I'm losing my spot here. 2 Peter chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 5. <clears throat> Look at verse number 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into, the chains of, into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Watch this. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. Watch this. A preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of, it says, the ungodly. Now right there it says that he preached, right? But it tells you very, very plainly, it says that he was a preacher of righteousness. Now, of what type of righteousness did Noah have himself? Righteousness. righteousness of faith. He was an heir of righteousness of faith. Now, before you get into other scriptures to prove this very clearly, what type of righteousness or in what method to obtain righteousness do you think he was preaching? The same way that he received it, right? You think he's pre preaching this alternative way to receive righteousness in which he did not receive it? No, it makes perfect sense that if he received righteousness through faith, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? He was preaching during this time. God said he gave him 120 years, right? During that time, the Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. Righteousness, and he was the heir righteousness which is by faith i want you to turn to another passage here we're going to look at this more clearly go to first peter chapter number three. <coughs> first peter chapter number three let's put a bulletin back there in genesis six we will go back from there here in just a few minutes first peter chapter number three <coughs> we begin reading in uh let's look at verse number 18 for christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Watch this. I want you to pay attention to the wording here. That he might bring us to God, be put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So now it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Right? Because he was, what specific spirit was he quickened by? The Holy Spirit, right? That's why they, the translators did a capital S right there. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. By which also he went... And preached unto the spirits in prison. Look at verse 20. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now there's a few things I want to point out to you about this that I, that I want to make sure that you understand. Number one, <clears throat> was God giving them the opportunity to get on the ark? No. The people, obviously Noah and his family, but all flesh. Did they have the opportunity to get on the ark? They did not. He was going to kill them and destroy them no matter what. They were going to die no matter what. Right? But the Bible tells you clearly and plainly that during that time, Noah was preaching. And he was a preacher of righteousness. We, we know the righteousness that he had was the righteousness of faith. Right here in verse number 20, it says, With some time, talking about those that were prisoners, right? were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God 
Look at this, waited in the days of Noah. So it almost seems to me like it didn't take 120 years for that ark to be built. You understand what I mean? It seems like God was just waiting or God dragged that process out. But it says clearly and plainly that God waited in the days of Noah. Why? Because there was a message that was being preached to people, and God wanted them to receive that message. It was being preached by the preacher of righteousness, which he himself had received righteousness by faith. But it says that the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a-preparing. So one thing that we can cl- conclude is he wasn't waiting to try to tell them, Hey, this is your last chance. Get in the ark. That was not the message he was preaching. You know why? Because the covenant was already made. God is not a man that he shall lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. The same God that promised you eternal life is the same God that came to Noah and said, you know, I'm going to destroy all flesh, but I'm making a covenant with you. That was a promise. He wasn't reversing that. People were not getting on that ark, but they were being preached something. I want you to notice here, it's very important in a way to learn how to study your Bible. In 1 Peter chapter number 20, it tells you that they were disobedient, right? It says they were disobedient, which sometimes were disobedient, saying these people were disobedient to the message that was being preached to them by Noah. We know that Noah was preaching, right? I want you to look over at a couple of places. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 7. We'll see a couple other times in the book of 1 Peter where it talks about people being disobedient. Look at verse 6 first. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold... I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. Watch this. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. <clears throat> Verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be what? Disobedient. Disobedient. And what are they not doing? They're not believing. Right. On who? Jesus. Right. The, the, the precious cornerstone, which is talking about Christ. He says, believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallow, it says the same is become the head of the corner. And then notice, keep reading verse 8. It says it again. The stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even, even to them which stumble at the word, look at this, being disobedient. To what? To the word being preached of Christ, of the coming Messiah, of Jesus. At this point, obviously, when this was penned of the Messiah that had come already. You're going to see, like I said, there's a pattern of this. I want you to go, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, I believe it's one of the first few verses. We'll read verse 1 too. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Look at verse 2. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through, watch this, sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Talking about the obedience of faith. Look at another passage here. I believe it's in chapter 4. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 17. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 17. The Bible says this. No, I'm sorry, not, not verse 17 yet. Let's look at... Maybe it's verse... Let's start in verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Time out. I noticed this earlier and I want to make another statement because Stephen Anderson came out and he's like trying to mock the idea that that you know he, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to focus on the clear scriptures that says that Jesus is the one on the throne in Revelation chapter number 20. He tries not to mess with that, but he wants to talk about how I believe that the, the judgment seat of Christ is the great white throne. But right here, do you know what this says? Read that closely one more time. Verse number five. Who shall give account to him? What is that? Plural? Singular. Right. They? No. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? I didn't even use this. There are so many scriptures. One God judges. One God judges. Not three persons. And, And one person judges the quick. One person judges the dead. It's not what the Bible teaches. One person judges. Do you know the who is here? Do you read back? Jesus. It's talking about Christ. There's one throne. There's one God. There's one judge. Judge of all earth. Verse number six. For for this cause was the gospel preached also. Look at this. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. That they might be judged according 
to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. I want you to jump back up right now. We're going to come back to this verse one more time. I want you to read that quickly. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 3 again. <clears throat> Look at verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit. By which also, talking about his Holy Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, I didn't look these verses up, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But when the Bible talks about if you look up the spirits in prison, it's a very specific phrase. You know what it's talking about? It's talking about the unsaved. It talks about specifically the Gentiles in the book of Isaiah. It's mentioned three or four times over and over again. The spirits in prison, you know, if you're not saved, you're in prison. That's what the Bible's talking about. You know how you know how Noah went and preached unto them by the Holy Spirit. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and Noah was a prophet of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And right here, when it says, "By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison," and then it says this, "which sometime were disobedient." So the, those that were in prison are those that were being preached to. He's talking about in the story of Noah. It's the Holy Spirit that's preaching to them, it says, and they were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. You go down, it says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, <coughs> not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Go to the next chapter, 4 verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh, watch this, hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice May suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Watch this now. Pay close attention. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Now look, pay close attention. For, meaning because, for this cause... Was the gospel preached also to them that are dead? Let's talk about those that are physically dead. Talk about those at, you know, that would have physically died when Noah was there and Noah was preaching to them. They were going to die either way, right? They had no hope as far as physically. They were going to die. The message was not, I always hear people like, turn or burn. That wasn't the message. That wasn't what was being preached. It was the gospel. It was the, it was the heir of righteousness of faith who was preaching it. And then it, it says this, though. Watch it. The gospel was preached also to them that are dead. Look at this. That they might be judged according to, I'm sorry, according to man in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. What did God say when he had made his mind up 120 years? I'm going to destroy all flesh. He said, my spirit. What spirit was Noah preaching by? Spirit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shall not always strive. Why? Because they were disobedient. Many of them were rejecting the gospel. My spirit shall not always strive with men. He said this, because they are also flesh. The reason why the gospel was preached to all of them, everyone that was upon the earth, or the reason why Noah was preaching to them, wasn't to get on the ark. He was preaching the gospel to them. That even though they were going to die, even though they were judged according to men in the flesh, they only had 120 years no matter what, they could live. After they died, they could live according to God and the Spirit. Look at, uh, in this same chapter, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 17, watch. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. At the house of God. So who is being judged here? People that are saved or unsaved. The house of God would be saved people. Right? If when Noah preached, you think people just no one got saved? No, people got saved. But guess what? They were judged according to men and flesh. He says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, 
What shall, the, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? What's the obedience and the disobedience repeatedly in the book of 1 Peter? Obeying the gospel of God. Being a disobedient to the gospel of God repeatedly. Look at what it says in the next verse. And if the righteous scarcely be saved. What does that imply? Are the righteous saved? Yes. But what does it mean scarcely? Barely. You know why? Because you still are punishing the flesh. That's why. Because the righteous who would have believed and then the, the flood was brought upon the waters, were they saved? Yes, according to the Spirit. According to the flesh? No. The righteous scarcely be saved. Look what it says. The righteous scarcely be saved. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? He's saying if, if even those that are saved are judged, even those that believed the message that Noah preached and the nest of uh, those that were obedient to the gospel when it was preached unto them, what shall the end be of them that obeyed not Noah's preaching? And what's the answer? Do you understand his point? They went to hell. That's his answer. They were judged according to men and flesh. He said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Right? You know, he said because he is also flesh. Saying I, he was going to put an end to the flesh. Why was his, how is his spirit striving with man? Did God, is there ever an instance where God just comes down and for years and years and years just strives with man and preaches? No, it doesn't happen like that. God uses men of God to preach his word. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Go back to Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. <coughs> So when we see here, I want you to think about this. There was, a, there was a covenant and a promise that was given in Genesis chapter number 3 to Adam and Eve. That of their seed, there would be what? A savior, a messiah that would ultimately you know, defeat he who came and, and brought you know, sin and death and hell, right? That there would be a, a messiah that would come of that seed. And would be victorious and would save them. He would be their savior. Now, if you look at how many people were saved on the ark, and you look at the family tree, everyone is dead but Noah. Everybody understand what I'm getting at? Everyone, everyone is dead but Noah and his children. You understand what I'm saying? Is there anyone left? Of which that covenant with Eve could have come through. A single person on the whole planet. And what's very interesting is the word, the wording that is used here. Look at when he says in Genesis chapter number six. Look at again verse number eighteen. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And he says, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife. And he says, and thy sons' wives. With me. You know what he tells Abraham? He tells him, My covenant is with thee, and then he says, And with thy seed. So you have Abraham, and then you have Isaac. You have Noah, and you have who? Shem. Did everybody know did anybody notice when we read in Luke chapter number three? What what it what the <coughs> this will help you understand something too. What it, it says when it's translated from Greek, Shem, when it's translated from Greek to English, does anybody know how it's written? Sim, exactly. You know what someone's called, like uh, us, because we don't believe that the Jews are, are any longer God's chosen people because that's what the Bible clearly teaches? You're anti-Semitic. You know what Sim is referring to? Sim is referring to the Jews, you know, their, their lineage being of Shem or Sim. Which is translated from the New Testament. Did anybody, is that new to anybody? Yeah. That's what Sim is referring to. You know why? Because Jesus, who was a Jew, who was an Israelite, he went back to Abraham, but guess what? It didn't stop at Abraham. That covenant that was given to Abraham, everybody thinks Abraham's like this single individual guy who received this covenant. Came before Abraham. That covenant that was given to Abraham, it didn't stop there. It went back to who? Sim. Shem. It went back to who? Noah. Turn to Luke chapter 3. <coughs> Luke 
chapter number three. And uh, yeah, we'll just read right there towards the end where it says, verse 36, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sim, which was the son of Noah. What did he tell him? He said, my covenant is with thee and with thy seed after me. Who was it? Sim. You know, you know what happened? What else happened when they got off that ark? You know, uh, it says that Noah began to be a husbandman. Right? He drank of the fruit of the wine. I don't know how I just almost quoted that word perfect, but he, he drank of the fruit of the wine of his vineyard. And then when he does so, it says he, you know, he was drunk. And then what happens? Son Ham. Son Ham comes. And you know what, what happens to Ham? He says that Ham's curse. And you know who receives the blessing? Sam. Which was Shem in the Old Testament. You know what happens with when Abraham has a son Isaac? You know what happens with Jacob and Esau? You know who's the eldest? Esau. You know what happened? It was taken from Esau and is given to Isaac. You know who's in that genealogy? Isaac. You know what happened with Jacob, very next generation? And you know who's the oldest? Does anybody remember who the oldest actually was? Reuben. Reuben, Reuben didn't receive the inheritance because he went in unto his father's wife. You know who received the inheritance? It was, cur- he was, he was, it was taken from Reuben. And he was actually given somewhat of a curse. And the blessing was given to Judah. You know why Sin was in that lineage? He was given that blessing. What was the blessing? It was the blessing of being that seed. Being in the line. And that's a great blessing. Knowing that, hey, of, of literally of my physical flesh will someday God come and be born as a man. That's amazing. Right. There's so many misconceptions in the Bible, so many things that you know Sunday school teaches that are wrong. You know why? And this is why, you know, you know, studying your Bible and putting deep study in your Bible, paying attention to every word matters. That covenant was not made, you know, was not just a covenant that was made with, with, with Noah that could have been revoked and more people could have got on the ark. He said, you and your family are only the ones getting on this ark. Do you know why? Because he was going to preserve the seed of the sons of God. Which was from it was was from Adam and Eve, Canaan, all of them, Enoch, or before Canaan, it would have been Methuselah, and all of them, and then you have Noah, the sons of God, right? And then you have Sim. The purpose of that was you're going to get on this ark, and we're going to preserve the pure bloodline of the coming Messiah before any more wickedness spreads. I'm going to make sure that I. And you know what? God, when He took out Abraham, He set that nation apart. All of that happened for a particular reason. Do you know why? To have a kingdom prepared, to have a pure nation of which God could be born of. And God could come. Your entire Bible, from Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, is pointing to Matthew chapter number 1, which is the generations of Jesus Christ. Everything! The promise given to Noah, the promise given to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, the Noah covenant... The, you know, the Adamic covenants, all the same, my friend. Every last one of them. All the covenants are what? It's the covenant of Jesus Christ. It's the covenant of grace. Amen. That's what it is. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. You know how Noah was saved? By grace. He was the heir. I want you to think about that too. The heir. What is Abraham repeatedly referred to as? He's the heir. It's not a different covenant. All of the people that are in Christ, it says he's going to gather together one day, right? Everything in Christ is heaven and earth. Abraham, Noah, Adam and Eve, they're all in Christ. They're all in Christ, and that covenant was always pointing to them. I want to point out a couple of things that are really interesting about about Genesis chapter number 6, and I'll be done here. I want you to look at Genesis chapter number 6. Look at verse number 16. Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 16. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 6 verse number 16 says this a window shalt thou make to the ark and, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above and it says this and the door of the ark shalt thou set it aside thereof the lower second and third story shalt thou make it this wasn't like a cruise ship this thing was like, like a, it was like a barge almost you know, that, that was designed just to withstand this. They weren't traveling anywhere. They were just being, they just wanted to preserve these people. Do you understand? And a massive boat like that, huge. Do you know how many doors were on it? 
one. The Bible tells you that was a picture of the resurrection in First Peter chapter number three. And you know what Jesus said in John chapter number ten? I think it's verse number nine. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You know who's, who was saved? It, it, it's a perfect picture because you know who you had walking into there? You had Noah, and then you had Sam, which were the generations of Jesus walking in there, who would someday come and be born. It's very interesting. Everything, whether it be figurative, whether it be a literal covenant, you know what's all pointing to? That's why the things on the Godhead matter, my friend. That's why, because you know what it is when you start teaching this junk, Jehovah's Witness, subordinationism, that you have God the Father and then some lesser God underneath of him? The whole Bible is about Jesus. Amen. And then you design this system, this model of just blasphemy is what it is, some pagan, heathen type of, you know, of, of, of what they refer to as Trinity, which is the unbiblical Trinity. It takes the glory away from Jesus Christ. When your whole Bible is trying to point you to him. All of it. There's figures in the Old Testament. You know what they are? They're about Jesus. There's a line. There's stories that are told. Do you ever read the book of Ruth and, and think, why is the Bible telling me a love story? Do you ever read that and think that? Because it kind of seems like it's just placed in there. Do you know why? The Bible's laid out chronologically. You know what it tells you at the very end? Exactly. You have... Um, what is it? Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David, of which was born the Christ, ultimately. It's like, why is this book in here? It's pointing you to the cross, my friend. It's what the whole Bible's about. All of it. Everything. And, and you're, you say, why does it matter if my kids go to Sunday school? Am I, you know, and, and, and integrated, uh, you know, we have integrated services and all this. It matters. Because this is a, 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 an example of that. Because you need to have someone that is studying the Bible. You need to have people that are being, you know, that are standing up behind the pulpit and they're preaching the truths of the Bible. When you put children in all, you have people that are unqualified to teach. You understand what I'm saying? And then they start teaching things that are not. The Bible is designed to bring glory to Jesus. And when people start, you know, not understanding the things of like the story of Noah, you know, you know what kids should be taught? Noah and Shem went onto that ark so that God could preserve the seed of, of Christ, which was coming someday. That's why he made he chose one of the sons of God, one of those that you know had you know he found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he had faith in God and he knew would be obedient to him. He's also a faithful man, and he chose of his line <coughs> to do that so that he could preserve the coming Christ. Every Bible story should be in some way pointing you to Jesus. The whole Bible is. From beginning to end. That's why I started my sermon talking about that. The promise, right? That's why I was speaking of the past two weeks. The promise. We saw the promise of the inheritance. That same inheritance. That same inheritance about Abraham. Noah was also an heir of that. It's all the same. It's all the same covenant. The whole Bible from beginning to end. Last point I wanted to make. When he's speaking with him. He says in Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 18, you may not have noticed this, but he says this. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wives, and thy sons' wives with thee. You notice that in the middle? He said, and thou shalt come into the ark. If you're not in the ark, what would you say? Go into the ark. What did he say? Where is he at? Look at Genesis chapter number 7, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come. Where is God at? He's in the ark. And he, the whole time, and he said, Come. Come into the ark. So that's that's comforting as well. The whole, and you don't think that was scary? <laughs> it's, it's, it's story <coughs> lightning the entire time. You know was there the entire time in the ark with them? God. Keeping them safe and looking after them. Amen. Remember when you read your Bible, do you know what it's about from beginning to end? It's about Jesus. Amen. Everything is about Jesus. Don't lessen the name of Jesus. It's the greatest name ever. God has ordained that he will receive power and praise and glory and honor through the name of Jesus from all eternity. Amen. And all these Christians better get used to praising God's name, the name of Jesus. Because that's the name above all names in this world and in the world to come. Amen. Get used to it. The name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word for everyone.
Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much, dear Lord, <coughs> for a great and mighty Savior. That it's you, dear Lord, that's the Savior, dear Father. And we didn't, <coughs> you didn't depend on somebody else because nobody else could have done the job, dear Lord. We thank you for just what amazing book and how clear the truths are, dear Lord. And that even if we're taught something confusing while growing up, it can always be straightened out if we become a diligent student of your word and we want to know the truth. Help us to always hear a value about this, to study... <coughs> To show ourselves approved and to desire to know the Bible and what the real truths of the Bible are. But not only that, help us to be valiant and to stand for those truths, no matter who stands against us. Enemies of, of your word or even, even those that are Christians, dear Lord God. We thank you so much for your word and just continue to bless us and be with us, dear God. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.